three, right? Oh, got it. Now we're on. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, or good morning, wherever in, which, in whatever part of the world you are. Uh, my name is Anastasia Felker, and I'm one of the co-organizers of the Postacomas uh, online seminar series. And in these seminar seminars, we do uh, provide a platform to discuss recent books on uh, memory studies uh, of the post-socialist region understood widely. And Postacomas is the working groups their working group on post-socialist and comparative memory studies at the memory studies uh, association and uh, today we are going to be discussing uh, the book by Eunice Blavaskunas that is uh, titled Foresters, Borders and Bark Beetles, The Future of Europe's Last uh, Primeval Forest, I hope I'm pronouncing it all correctly, that has been published uh, by Indiana University Press back in 2020, so last year. Uh, today we have the author of the book and two discussants. Let me very briefly introduce uh, all three of them, uh, after which I will give the word to uh, Patrice uh, Dabrowski. So Eunice Blavaskunas is Associate Professor of Anthropology and Environmental Studies at Whitmo uh, College in Walla Walla. And for more than 25 uh, years, she has been researching and writing about conservation politics in Europe. She studies how humans recover ecologies, uh, use forests and conserve nature with a focus on nationalism, post-humanism and post-socialism. Our uh, first discussant is Patrice uh, Dabrowski, who is a historian with degrees from Harvard University and the Fletcher School of Law and Demo uh, Demo uh, sorry, Diplomacy. Just her research interests include Polish and Central East European history, nation building and nationalism, festivals and commemoration, and urban history, environmental history, and intersectional politics and culture. Her recent, uh, most recent book uh, is entitled The Carpathians, Discovering the Highlands of, uh, of Poland and Ukraine, has been published this year by Cornell University Press. And our second discussant is Markus Kroszka, who is a historian and translator currently teaching um, uh, at Justus uh, Liebig University, Gießen. And his research interests include contemporary history of Poland, history of the former East European territories, um, history and histori historiography, but also uh, he did uh, publish a book on uh, the subject of our today's discussion, uh, subject of our discussion, which is the Bella uh, Forest. The book was published back in uh, 2017. And in 2019, he also co-organized a conference uh, at the Herder Institute for Historical Research in Central Europe that uh, was titled Reimagining Polish World uh, Wideness, Cross-Local Encounters and Global Arrangements. Therefore, I... Uh, I'm kindly uh, giving the word to Patrice Dombrowski, who will chair today's discussion. Great, thank you. Well, let me begin by thanking you for this opportunity to read and introduce this fascinating, timely, and thought provoking book. The author is to com be commended for her nuanced and complex look at the most famous of Poland's forests. Forester's Borders and Bark Beetles tells a story of the last protected lowland primeval forest on the territory of Europe, a relic of the past when Europe had been covered with forests. The forest in question is known as Białowieża in Polish, uh, uh, Belowieżkaya in Belarusian. Parts of the primeval forest or Puszcza are to be found on both sides of the border. But not all of Białowieża is protected or pristine. In other words, from the very outset, we are dealing with a region that is not fully primeval. The strict reserve on the Polish side amounts to but 9% of the forest. Other parts are lesser reserves and the significantly larger managed forests of the state forests, which are still being logged to this day. As a result, one of the problems facing the region today relates to the ambiguity of Białowieża. In the minds of some, it is equated with primeval forest, which needs protection, whereas for others, it is still a source of employment in the timber industry. In addition, it should be underscored that people actually live in the forest. 
this book deals above all with Yunus Blavas Kunas's encounters with the forest, its inhabitants and its visitors on the Polish side of the border over a span of some 24 years beginning in 1995. It is not simply a work of environmental history, all it is surely that. Rather, Blavas Kunas casts her book as an ethnography Furthermore, as an ethnography about the way different pasts trouble nature conservation. A question posed by the author at the outset is, I quote, how does a primeval forest shape multi-scalar historical projects, some intensely local and all ideological? Here I would like for her to parse this further. Are there no non-ideological projects or narrations, or does any reference to a past make them perforce ideological? Uh, the layout of the book reflects Blavaskunas's ethnographic emphasis. It consists of seven chapters, all thoughtfully and aptly titled. I will give each in turn as the titles themselves may open up space for questions from the audience. Uh, chapter one, Pushcha of Forests and Time is the introduction. Uh, and chapter seven, the conclusion is titled Temporal Dimensions. The past is not safe at all. The element of time in both of these chapters suggests a major role in the book, certainly in its framing, for historical considerations and perceptions of the past as played out in nature's realm. Sandwiched in between are five chapters dealing with different categories of protagonists, for the most part interviewees. Chapter two deals with the foresters, or rather the forester, per its title, here referring to the idea of the forester and his role as an authority in the region. Chapter three, scientists and the communist past, syndromes, disorders, and a proper elite shifts to the Forster's rivals, the scientists. The idea of a proper elite, which is what the scientists thought they were, or a proper nat nation hints at what is being striven for in the post-communist period. Chapter four, post-peasant cosmo cosmopolitics, rather, man of the forest, takes a look at the peasants or locals, in particular one who made good use of his agency to redefine himself. Chapter five, borderland engagements, relict forest, relict communism, turns to the tourists, the outsiders in search of the natural and the exotic, neither of which may fully measure up to expectations and a new tourist infrastructure since Poland's accession to the European Union. And last, but certainly not least of the substantive chapters, chapter six is titled Resurgence, Outbreaks of Bark Beetle and Right-Wing Nationalism. It presents the saga of and dilemma posed by the climate change induced spread of the spruce bark beetle, as well as its controversial programmatic eradication via logging by the present Polish government of the Law and Justice Party or Peace. As a historian, I find Blavaskunas's ethnographic approach both fruitful for the chapters of truly illuminating and at times frustrating. Frustrating because there is no overall argument for a reviewer to cite. This is not a book guided by a single argument. The author claims that, I quote, would betray the complexity of people in the forest and her relationships with them. And indeed, the book's protagonists defy easy categorization. So one question would be, how representative are the voices the author chooses to cite? A number of them seem to represent the atypical margins. This despite the chapter's focus on discrete groups. Although naturally, even those on the margins can be made to fit into various narratives. Uh, the book begins with a timeline of the forest's history. It and later texts provide a factual grounding for the stories that emerge in and from the book. For Blavaskunas's subtle and nuanced approach teases out the all too humanly contrived narratives of Białowieża's past, 
that is narratives in the plural. These paths are not formulated for history telling's sake, but rather because they have implications for the future. The author might just have as easily have used for her subtitle, the past and future of Europe's last primeval forest, but doubtless that would be too long for the publisher. This notwithstanding, each telling of the past, each ethno history colors the teller's view of what the forest is and should be. So why all this talk about the past or pasts? The lowland mixed deciduous forest that dates from the Holocene period has seen more than its share of different regimes, indeed of chaos. For many centuries, it was a protected hunting ground for Poland Lithuania's royalty, meaning that conservation could be found as early as the early 15th century. Białowieża lay on the border of those two territories, Poland and Lithuania, and had a population in the main that we would today label Belarusian. Thus, from the outset, we had a borderland situation, both physically and population-wise. All of this complexity was complicated further by waves of war and occupation. After the partitions of the country in the late 18th century, Białowieża came under the control of Tsarist Russia, which alternately exploited and protected the forest. Polish uprisings against the Tsar had insurgents fighting and sheltering and ultimately hanging in the forests. The German occupation of the forest during World War I resumed its exploitation in true colonial fashion, even killing off the last of, it, of the bison. How ironic that the Nazi German occupation in World War II should wish to preserve what was left. For in the interim, the multi-ethnic short-lived interwar Polish state had established the first national park and brought back the bison. Following World War II, the pendulum swung once more as did the borders. The new post-war Poland lost 60% of the Białowieża forest as well as its political independence to the Soviet Union. The forest continued to be decimated if receding or replanting was also done under the watchful eye of the foresters. Small subsistence farms continued to operate. Whereas earlier there had been tension between the Polish foresters and the Belarusian or local population, the population's ethnic identity was downplayed in communist Poland, which after the war had become much more of a pure nation state than it had ever been before. Even today, part of the population prefers to identify not as Belarusian or Polish, but as Tutejszy, that is from here, local. So what happened to this seemingly backward peripheral region after the great caesura of 1989, the collapse of communism, and 2004, Poland's entry into the European Union? This is the period where Blavaskunis' research begins. It turns out that the legacy of so many occupations of the Polish fight for independence being fought in the forest as well, were the materials from which a new post-communist narrative could be shaped. But the narrative that currently is in the ascendant is not the narrative some expected. Post-communist cons conservationists expected a return to, or even an expansion of conservation in a world where so few natural spots remain a suitable position to be assumed by a modern Western developed Poland. Instead, as the book so finely demonstrates, the foresters supported in the main by the local population have continued to champion intensive human management of the Białowieża forest. Grist for their mill has been provided by climate change, which has resulted in the spread of the spruce bark beetle in the forest. Foresters in the present government argue that only by logging and clearing dead wood can this be managed, whereas conservationists and entities of an international or global scope decry both. The nationalistic stance of peace is reflected in its desire to manage its own natural resources without the interference from global or supranational entities. 
This despite the 2014 UNESCO World Heritage Site designation for the whole of Biao Vieja, as well as EU restrictions. Those who disagree with peace are painted as non-Polish or enemies of Poland. The peculiar nationalistic modernity of peace seems to have found its modo in the forest. Thus, this work of ethnography and environmental history is right in the middle of present day memory policy. So, so much for a summary and ways of, of where the book goes. Let me pose a couple of questions before I pass the floor on to Marcus. So, regarding the thorny questions of authenticity, primevalness and ambiguity. Current definitions of the forest have straightjacketed it to fit a particular narrative. Is there any way of getting around this, barring writing a book like yours that seems to cover all sides, both what has been forgotten or omitted, as well as what has been remembered and emphasized? As someone who knows the forest better than we, the readers do, how would you define Biao Vieja? Uh, another question, uh, what role, if any, has the country of Belarus played in this bark beagle saga that you so interestingly uh, explained to us? How has it responded, that is, assuming that the beetle does not respect borders, or perhaps it does, I don't know. And a last point of clarification, you wrote in your introduction, I quote, that the dramas that will play out in this book all center around the question of who is secretly collaborating and, and openly on the side of Russia, even as they might outwardly appear anti-Russian or anti-communist. Uh, I'd like for you to unpack this for us, please. And again, thank you for a wonderful book. And I will pass the floor out now to Marcus. Thank you very much, Patrice, for your concise introduction. And I think we, in some regards, oh, we have similar questions to, to the book and to the author, but, but let's see. So I, I try to do a mixture between comment and, and, and question now. Um, confronted with such a diverse and enriching book as Eunice has written, it's not at all easy for me to focus on some questions or comments. This is all the more true because I'm not unbiased. We have talked about Biovieja and Eunice's research from time to time over the past few years. And in the process as a historian, I have found the ethnological and cultural anthropological approach in particular, extremely enriching. So in a way it was the opposite of uh, Eunice's work uh, I dealt with. Bored and sometimes annoyed by the overemphasis on everything historical for obvious political, national, and religious purposes, I started looking for other approaches to better understand this multicultural region in the east of Poland and the west of Belarus. I have begun, uh, began uh, to, to experiment with different theoretical models, most notably actor network theory but also more recently with elements of practice theory, with considerations of performance and contingency, and the interaction of humans, animals, plants, and non-living objects. It is on these questions of interaction that I feel in harmony with Eunice, and some of the names she mentions as important to her in her book are also important uh, to me, such as Donna Haraway and Anna Tsing. Somehow, Hovering above it all for me is the unforgettable Janusz Korbel, one of the most interesting people I was privileged to know, albeit very briefly. This is just an introduction to position myself in tonight's scenario. Thanks especially to Anastasia Felchert for the invitation to, to take part. So now my comments and questions. What is this Biao Vieja actually and how can one approach it in order to understand it. On the one hand, it seems like an alien element in the sometimes one-dimensional, monolithic, national Catholic space of Poland. But on the other hand, the same forces are at work here as in the rest of the country. Questions are discussed and problems are raised that are just as pressing elsewhere. These are questions of European modernity, globalization, 
and the profound changes resulting from man-made climate change. But how can they be grasped? Personally, I do not consider the concept of identity useful and thus in a way um, I just uh, 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 used Lutz Niethammer's disparaging formulation of the so-called plastic word. Rogers Brubaker also criticized fixed attributions some time ago when he spoke of groupism. Namely, I quote, the tendency to represent the social and cultural world is a multichrome mosaic of monochrome ethnic, racial, and cultural blocks, end of the quotation. However, the actors changing interests are much more likely to be re reflected in situational and temporary practices that are not always easy to understand from outside. The actors in themselves are not always aware of them. Eunice has also recognized these problems and finds two ways to resolve them. Firstly, in the description of archetypes, and secondly, by trying to explain the behavior of her heroes, but not presuming to be able to resolve all forms of thought and action. First of all, as already mentioned, there is the archetype of the forester. He is always male and is mostly described in the singular. I quote, the forester is a figure on the threshold of breaking through a cultural unconsciousness and showing us the cusp of modernity by both rejecting and tempting it, end of quote. In a way, he embodies the inside as well as the outside of Biao Vieja, the local as well as the national. He has undergone some interesting changes of meaning over the decades. In a sense, he came from outside as a representative of the state and thus of Polishness, but is nevertheless in the tradition of the mythic, mythically hyperbolized insurgents against the Russians in the 19th century, as well as the deported and murdered Poles of the Second World War. As a member of a professional group, he first emerged from the economic penetration of the forest in the 18th century, which started in Germany and Russia. But he also knows the forest like no other and defends the status quo against foreign influences from the wider world. As a kind of father figure and the determinant of order, he specifies the path as a figure that is both mythical and cyclically recurring, which can also embody different systems through its different linguistic codes. In the German rural context too, he was and is a kind of respected figure, a steward of nature. This image is not entirely positive, however, but, an, but can also turn wishes, as for instance in Ernst Jünger's novel of the Marmorklippen on the Marble Clips from 1939. The second archetype is that of the scientist. He usually comes from outside and in a precisely balanced system of locals, peoples from the surrounding area and strangers, basically always belongs to the latter, no matter how long he has lived in the village. There are also conflicts between different groups of scientists because the graduates of the forestry colleges have different interests than the cosmopolitan natural scientists who tried to change the entrenched system after 1989. Often the latter had been active in the Solidarność opposition and fought against the formal and informal structures of the People's Republic. Yet the attempt to build a middle class and civil society failed because of the realities of the so-called system of the gift as described by Marcel Mauss, which exists in a way independent of political realities. Favors within real socialism turned into capitalist corruption, sometimes with the same participants. However, the individual case shows as Eunice very nicely demonstrates with the example of Simona Kosak, the legendary biologist from Biao Vieja, that people are precisely very complex beings who can never be fully understood. In the conflicts of the 1990s and 2000s, the conflict between tradition and modernity becomes particularly visible when large parts of the village population did not understand the career models of the scientists and also accused them of mistreating animals, for example, by using collars for tracking and then disappearing again out of the life of uh, local population. The conflicts over the management of the national park basically extend to the present. The third archetype is that of the former farmer or so-called post-peasant. Here two myths come into play. 
these include the nostalgia of the better life under communism, the expectations of the new tourists, and the capitalist fixations of the inhabitants in a community where there is hardly any real agriculture left. And then there are the people somehow on the edge, like Leszek, the so-called black stork, who embodied in his own opinion the quintessential free man of the forest, a man with few possessions but a cultivated knowledge from a lifetime of experience in one place. He plays with the new worlds, the media's interest in him but still remains authentic in his own uh, way and does not enrich himself. On the one hand, this raises the question of what outsider means in a traditional system and what it means in a capitalist one, in a new capitalist world. <clears throat> a very interesting observation is that tourism and ultimately the view of one's own past functions primarily through images of the past, nostalgia project, progress. You take elements of your past and relegate them to artifacts to neutralize that past. Eunice refers to Clifford Geertz's uh, deep play. And as we know, the end of the play is always open. Everyone involved is changing. Locals create the past that tourists expect. The new residents who mostly come from the city have certain ideas about village life and want to educate the locals. A phenomenon we also encounter in rural areas north of Berlin, for example, now. Eunice summarizes the situation like this, I quote, it took many years of living in Białowieża for me to understand two competing cultural versions of the peasant. In one version, the peasant represents a universal image, a person living close to nature, rich with tradition, generous, and not compelled by the logic of modern capitalism. In the, under, in the other version, local peasants of the Białowieża forest outgrow their peasant status much earlier than the post-socialist break with the past. In the outgrown peasant version, the local people are a rough hewn working class always subject to the patronage of the forester and to the industry of logging." End of quote. The question of change becomes clearest when we look at the role of history and its reconstruction. Specifically, since 1918, this has meant the polonization of the landscape, the cultivation of the Kresse myth, myth and the overwriting of everything foreign, in this case, Russian Orthodox, which was only partially successful. So if the forest is primarily Polish, and here we come to the fourth artifact, so is the bark beetle. It's the ideal projection surface for everything negative that comes from outside. The consequence of this, however, is a selection as far as the interaction of man with his environment is concerned. Ecology understood in this way is then linked to Isabel Stenger's formula, I quote, the science of multiplicities, disparate causalities, and unintentional creations of meaning, end of quote. Some aspects were cut out of history by the Polish nationalists, such as the lack of plurality, plurality of the interwar period. The bark beetle appears as an extraordinary historical agent. I quote again, the beetle in ecological terms co-creates an undeniable difference in the forest composition and in material terms becomes the pretext for a logging intervention that is also in political economic terms, an intervention against those <clears throat> who do not live up to the ideal of the Polish nation under the peace government or who betrayed the Polish nation in the post-socialist period, end of quote. But ultimately without the forest and its national charge traditions, there is no Poland. Change and becoming are acceptable at most where natural processes in the forests are concerned. Basically, however, everyone knows <clears throat> that changes cannot be stopped from the outside. In a way, this is the tragedy of classical conservatism. Polish self-dwarfing through exuberant nationalism and blinkers towards the world, as is currently happening, only delays the inevitable. The book is not primarily about phenomena of memory, quite the opposite, one could say, because large part of histories are still taboo. But it is, again a quote, quotation, but about the idea of a forest in relation to modernity over a period of time where the politics of the past occurred at the everyday level in the forest, end of quote. 
Returning to my first point, it is precisely very difficult to find a vocabulary that can capture and illuminate when individuals followed the political ideologies that were supposed to correct the past <clears throat> and when they were more committed to their respective social groups within the respective social hierarchies. Peasants, entrepreneurs, foresters, scientists, aristocrats, forest activists, nationalists and communist sympathizers were the categories with staying power, but formed according to the person or individuals or social groups. Between these types of social actors and always in the midst of the forest, there seemed to be a contagion of ideas about the past, writes Yunis. But is, it is, but is it really the professional groups that decide or rather the family imprints, experiences in one's social life, contacts with the outside world or the influence of the church or the media? The concise examples Yunis has given us seem to point in this direction. However, this makes things infinitely complex but we rather need simplifications, a selection to understand things. Eunice, as a good anthropologist always does, kept questioning herself, but not everyone does that. How can we as scientists deal with the fact that we create good narratives, but can never overview the totality of phenomena? <clears throat> I do not want to go further into other interesting aspects here, such as the question of nature conservation and modernity, Rather, in order to understand Biao Vieja even, even better today, I would like to know what it actually stands for. That's the same question uh, uh, Patrice already posed. Um, is it still the, the other, exotic, and thus perhaps also threatening Poland, as which the entire Eastern territories were understood in the interwar period? Is it a burning glass of other social conflicts? What role does the Orthodox, the Russian, the Belarusian play today? And of course, does the refugee issue of today, the building of a wall that restores conditions at the time of the People's Republic have long-term or will have long-term effects on the region? Is the observed, observed turn toward nationalism an inevitable one? Does it have a different impact on political life than in other regions? What are the opinions of local people speaking an Eastern Slavonic dialect and belonging to Orthodox Church? To conclude, Denise has written a book on Biao Vieja from an anthropological perspective, which is fed with additional elements of other sciences, especially history. <clears throat> she wrote the book, I would have been glad to write in from, uh, uh, from a historical perspective, which is fed with additional anthropological elements, if I had the opportunity to do so. I greatly benefited from reading this book, although I knew or at least suspected most of the author's assessments. On the one hand, she gave me methodological suggestions on how to better understand the history and present of Biao Vieja. On the other, she has combined aspects into a narrative that I would not have suspected, and she has helped me to better understand people I have met either in reality or in her texts. I really could not have expected more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcus. Let's give the floor now to Eunice to respond to both of us. Wow. <laughs> Thank you both. Um, I, I feel so enriched by your comments, your reads, um, your provocations. Um, so just thank you. Oh, ah, sorry. We'll ignore that. Um, uh, I'm going to say that I don't know how to answer all of your questions, but I'm going to take a few of them and then hope that we can circle back around to you repeating the question or asking it. But also, I think it's very important to think about what kind of methodological commitments do historians have and which do anthropologists have. And of course this comes out in the book, but I think it's important to bring into the discussion here. Um, so, um, 
of course, I could not have written this book without thinking historically. Um, but what does that actually mean to think historically, right? Where does one go to source uh, different paths? How does one do that at the level of I'm in uh, the Bioveja forest or village or villages or this realm of literature and archives for many, many years. And uh, at some points, I'm very convinced I'm going to write a book. At other points, you're thrown under the bus because one of your informants has just committed suicide or you know, people that you really loved and respect are suddenly saying very ugly things about your other people that you know and respect. And so here I am in the middle of all of this. And I'm always aware that I'm going to write a book, but I think it's very different approach than this imagined scholarly model of, I've now written a grant proposal. I'm going into the field to get exactly what I need to get. <laughs> I know which theory I'm operating with, and here's the book. Um, so th this leads me into the question of what is Bioviesia? Is there something ontological essential about this place? Um, and that's an important question um, that relates to the title, which by the way was a publisher's title and not my own title, but I'm okay with it. Um, I mean, my, my first title was Of Forest and Time, which the publisher thought, oh, that's, that's far too ambiguous, right? Um, and they were really convinced that future needed to be in there. And I said, oh, but it's all about the past. It's not about the future. Anyway, so there's this long negotiation. And, and I mentioned that because, you know, I, I'm also in the forest and they maybe, you know, this very small percentage of the forest that is this primeval place. I go there and of course I'm in love with this forest. Um, I, I write this book as a, as a, I'm motivated to write this book out of a love for a particular set of beings that were around me. Um, and I understand uh, the slippery slope of turning everything into ambiguous chaos or postmodernity. So I have to make choices as I think about this book, right? What is, is this book about my career? Is it about the forest itself? Is it somehow about explaining um, different intertwined histories? Um, so I'm gonna say first and foremost, like I had to be motivated by a love of place, which is only also a love of this forest because I'm also in love with certain people in this forest. And I think those people come out even as, as those people might be uh, wild cards or might not always be in love with me. Like I certainly love each of the characters in this book. I mean, even the forester as an archetype, um, as a historical figure, um, so I, I write from that place of love, but I also, I hope that I write with an urgency in this kind of global context of places like the strict reserve national park really are important, but we can't tell that story and we can't, I don't think that we could actually, uh, give breathing space to something that will become in this forest without attending to the ways the forest has been heavily logged the way that nationalists have seized upon the image of this forest. So I can't just write my own version of this forest as one thing. I'm always triangulating, uh, triangulating the responsibility of, I know Leszek Szumarski and Janusz Korbel and Adam Weirach and the people who become the uh, leaders of this ONR, the, kind of youth fascist movement. Like I know all of these people <laughs> and it, it's, some of them have died, which is unfortunate, but also makes it a lot easier to write about them. I mean, that's sort of the historian's advantage, right? But others are there and how do I switch their names around? How do I write about them? So the forest is multiplicities, um, but they, uh, I think at the core of its, 
international appeal, the reason that people in Great Britain or the United States or Spain or Japan might be interested in this book is always because, wow, how is it that this forest in Europe is the last of something, right? Um, so the book only has currency because of that. And I don't want to exploit or milk that in any way. I want readers to see that as a place of my own personal commitment, but I, I don't, I will also want to be honest. And I think honesty, again, means uh, attending to the majority of this forest that is mostly not that. Um, and I love the way Marcus is getting me to think about imprints and groupism, uh, the concept of identity. Um, and, and here again, you, you can't, I mean, I could write a historical anthropology uh, that tried to be very experimental and go beyond notions of ethnic groups, the nation at certain moments in time. But I also feel like that's irresponsible. I have, I think there has to be some way in which we're attending, I'm attending as an anthropologist to what it is people say about themselves and how they identify while still doing the, the theoretical work, which for me had to happen chapter by chapter. It was too, uh, I don't know, I couldn't find it within myself to write a book that had one totalizing theoretical narrative that everything was going to fit into that was too too Descartes you know that's too much like a straight line through the forest um so yeah I hope that I've done that through each of these characters which in many ways each of the characters beside from the let's say the the book ends here we have the chapter two which is about the forester and we have chapter six which is about bark beetle um and then in the middle there are really like I know this person, they have this story. Um, those characters are oddballs. They don't easily represent, but you know, uh, this is famous American anthropologist, Paul Rabinow, who wrote this book, uh, Reflections on My Fieldwork in Morocco. He was Clifford Geertz's student. Um, it's a, a very dated book now from the seventies, but he actually writes about how when you find misfits, they're so generative for the anthropologist because they actually show you why they don't fit. Um, and then you get to explore all of these other sets of meanings that exist around them. Um, so I hope that nods to or gestures to why I might write a book in that way. Um, let's see here. I'm sort of the title of the book. Um, it probably is a, a book that a title. I mean, I, I came down with like, all right, let's call it then Foresters, Borders and Bark Beetles. And the publisher said, well, how about the future of Europe's last primeval forest? And I'm, I don't now regret that future is in there in relation to temporality, in relation to much of the books focused on the past. Um, because oops, I think somebody's unmuted here. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I I know you don't. I you Sorry. know I don't. Okay, I'm opening up, I'm opening on my email. You know, I there was. Excuse me. Could, could you please and could you please mute yourself? Yes. Thank you so much. Sorry. It's okay. Um, I lost my train of thought a little. Oh, the future. Yeah. I, I think that question in the title makes us think about why are why are any of us writing books about the past? Um, and our you know, and here we get to Patrice's question about the ideological. Is there any way of getting around this? 
Um, and uh, I think that each of us has an obligation as a scholar to be thinking about worlds that are possible into the future as we write because of what has already occurred. And the ideological for me is when, uh, you know, the narrative becomes too narrow, when uh, we foreclose the possibilities of the future because we think that the future has to follow this pattern of the past. And I think the, the quote that Marcus um, referred to from Isabel Stengner's suggests exactly that, that um, and I don't have it right in front of me and we could go back to it, but I think our obligation as scholars is to uh, open up possibilities for the future, again, based on what the past is, or at least that's my set of obligations as, as a thinker and not just as somebody who wants to write a descriptive history of the past that's sort of limited by everything else that is already written about the past. And this is why I continue to find anthropology exciting because it lets us go to voices which typically don't always find their way into history. Um, voices of ordinary people, odd events, smells, insects. Um, yeah. So maybe um, this would be easier for me if we go back to Patrice and Marcus or other folks to then sort of ask me what what questions I'm not thinking about, um, what questions you'd like to explore further. And I'm happy also just to open this up so that I'm not the only voice talking. I think a conversation would be really lovely around, uh, yeah, how do we do these questions? And I don't know if everyone in the room has read the book or not also. So I'm, I'm happy to uh, take questions from those maybe who haven't read the book, but are really uh, excited about the pathways that Patrice and Marcus have laid out. Mm -hmm. uh, would, would you like just to open up the floor then? Or, or Marcus, do you have something that you want to continue uh, uh, exploring with Eunice uh, before we do that? Not necessarily. I think mm -hmm. we, I, I could I, I could do some some more points or the same points again uh, in in the talk of 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 discussion. But uh, if anybody mm -hmm. else has some questions, I I think it's, it would be highly uh, appreciated. Mm -hmm. Yes. Why don't we do that then? Why don't we open up the floor for some questions, and then of course, Marcus, at some point you can come back in with some more questions or follow up uh, for Eunice as well. So let's take a look if. Uh, how, how do people here respond with questions? Do you raise your hand or you just speak up? Uh, both. Both. All right. I'm looking for hands or looking for comments or questions or clear points of clarification or. Let me see if I can get so I can see everybody. Or the questions might also appear in the chat. So dear audience. Ah, let me look at the chat. Okay, but hmm. I don't see anything in the chat at all. I could uh, maybe take us to another direction. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think that would be a, a question we could have between historians and anthropologists. And I don't know um, if other people in this room are from other disciplines. Um, maybe there's some foresters in the room. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm very interested in, and Marcus, especially in your book, like what kind of obligation do you think you have to the future in, in writing your own book about this place? And I should say Marcus's book was written with two other authors um, and looking at the UNESCO World Heritage Site, the bison. Um, it's in German, so I haven't, I don't know if I've carefully understood all of its arguments, but. Well, I, I think uh, it's, it's, it's a quite traditional book. So I had within this, I had, I had to write with the same way my colleagues did. So rather traditionally as a, as a typical historian writes about facts, how it could have happened, how it happened. And uh, uh, 
especially uh, you, you already mentioned the 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 the, the term the decisive term of time. For historians, of course, time is the most decisive factor. And uh, but as I as I see in your book, it's 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 almost the same. So without time, you couldn't have written such a book. The the factor of time. So this is not this is not the difference. I think. And and I've learned uh, with within my my let's say scientific life to 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 change the way I write books or, or write texts. And I learned that uh, that as you as you said, uh, it's better to to present open models, to 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 leave space for for discussion, to develop theses co uh, which can be um, fruit fruitful or not. But it's not that one sole question you have to answer dealing with a problem. So this 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 open way of 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 um, um, Getting closer to your topic, to to find different um, aspects, approaches from different from di from different um, um, sciences, uh, might be only fruitful for for the reader too. Of course, you might expect some different aspects from a typical historical book, more facts, for instance. But I think this is not the way you should write about. Um, a history of a region which is, as we know, highly dependent on the time you, in which you wrote, uh, write this history. So the time, our lifetime, the, the, the consequence of our own uh, historical experiences, the contacts we have, the, the lectures we had, and so on. So this, this open, this so-called postmodernist openness might help us um, not to uh, follow only one model, one theory, one hierarchical uh, um, argument, a set of arguments, but to, to, to play a bit with narratives, to, to be more open to personal uh, fates and, and so on. And I, I, I very much admired in your book how cautious you have been describing the persons you, you dealt with, how you, 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 you try to be just to to be honest and that's that's a very important fact that because no no person is is only good or only bad or somewhere in between but it is those aspects in in different situations in this in different constellations how they react how they say the the truth as they think or they lie or, or have personal advantages from something. So that this is the the fascinating aspect in uh, from from this book and I think the way historians should write history nowadays is not that much different from the way cultural anthropologists should write. So we are all in a, in a certain way, cultural scientists. So that's, that would be my answer to this, to this point you, you, you mentioned. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, culture is something that's changing, right? I mean, that has changed over time. I mean, this is what history tells us. I mean, not just ethnic identities, but for me, the the forest is this this large area with many different beings in it. Um, and how do you? I mean, so there's the question of time, but there's also the question of scale. Like, <laughs> what unit of individual, of being, of species, of person? is meaningful and in which ways like how can we both go in and out um we i said well it is we i'm an author here making some decisions but i'm not making these decisions without beetles and oaks and janusz korbel and everyone else Well, I guess I would just add something to a point that Marcus already made was talking about your honesty. This is something we, I think we're all underscoring. Uh, and, you know, for me, it was it was very refreshing to, to hear your lack of, of be, their inability to be able to, to, to place everybody into those particular categories. Um, while at the same time presenting those categories as something that people operate with. I mean, they think of the forest or, or they stereotype uh, the scientists or whatever. So you've got both 
the best of both worlds. You had the categories, but you also have pushing up against the margin of them. And again, this, this sense of, of, of telling it as it was, whether or not you can fully understand it. Yeah. I, I'm wondering if it might be useful to go to, um, I think it was Patrice's question about Belarus and people were asking about the border situation right now. So for those of you who don't know, um, there are many refugees trapped in the borderland. I mean, at the site of the Biovieja forest or Belaviskaya Puscha um, from Syria, Cameroon, uh, Iraq, many places that have been flown in perhaps, um, you know, I'm not sure if the flights are free or cheap or who's paying for them, but flown into Minsk and then bust to the border, pushed into the Polish side of the border and then pushed back by the Polish guards and then pushed back to Poland and pushed back to Belarus. Um, and it's cold and it's wet. And we're talking about the thousands here and the, the border has become a state of emergency situation. Um, it's hard, I follow it on Facebook um, what my friends are doing, um, people in Bielvieja are up to, but it's hard for me to fully understand. But, and in some ways, you know, I, I look at my book now and I think, oh, it's already, it's so dated. <laughs> it's so historical. But um, I hope that my book is getting people in Poland, if they read it, if they read it in Bielvieja to self-reflect. Um, and I know that's hard for many of us to do when somebody else writes about us, um, but to self-reflect in a way that asks, um, why, why is this border there? What has borderland meant in the past? To what degree of suffering have people, or to what degree of, um, has the border like caused such suffering and in which ways um, and what are our obligations to think about flows of human beings in this moment of climate change? Um, and whether or not you know people are fleeing from war or climate change and both, I think the, the question is upon us of uh, uh, what, what does it mean to uh, check our nationalist ideals about who belongs, who can flow through a border, who can't flow through a border. Um, and I hope that um, there are many more books that are going to come out, but before that, about what's happening right now at the Bielvieja border. Um, but before that happens, I just also put out um, care and thought to anyone who's caught at the border right now in this forest, which becomes probably not a, a place of beauty, right? Not a place of, uh, or not even a place of forestry, but probably a place of a lot of fear, um, a lot of fear of uh, any kind of wolves that might be there, fear of hypothermia, fear of border guards, uh, anybody that might look like a border guard, even if that's a forester in uniform, um, yeah. Can you say an, another word or two about the Belar Belarus's position vis-a-vis -vis the bark beetle? Yeah. Well, I mean, course. did they, they take the same sort of approach that Peace did? I don't know. Yeah. Well, so yes. So uh, it's a very interesting moment, and I think it comes out very briefly in one of the chapters. Maybe it's about the forester. Um, on the Belarusian side, they've been doing sanitary logging for the bark beetle for many years now. Whereas on the Polish side, there was all of this, there were all of these rules going back to the 1990s about leaving dead woody debris on the forest floor, um, which is a breeding ground for bark beetle, especially if it's spruce, that's dead woody debris. So, um, you know, since the Belarusian side became a national park and probably even before, like dead wood has been cleared out of that forest for a long time. There are many bigger, older trees overall on the Belarusian side of the forest. And maybe Marcus has visited it more than I have. I've only been there twice. But um, I mean, the forest looks very tidy in its undergrowth. So, uh, you know, at, at, 
uh, there was a point maybe around the year 2000 when all of these Polish foresters were looking to Belarus and saying, wow, Belarus really has this right there. The forester really has authority and control. But the forester in Belarus, they all worked for the national park and you had sawmills within a national park that was also managing for bark beetle and doing logging and you know had everyone working, anyone who lives on the Belarusian side of the forest generally works for the, the national park. Um, but the national park meaning logging and tourism. So. Great, thank you. Let's see if we can get some questions from anyone else in the audience. Uh, it's definitely a book worth reading. I can say that much. I, I got a lot out of it and I like thinking about it in relationship to my own work on the Carpathian Mountains, in particular, the, the socialist period in the Bishjadu. I don't take my narrative up as far as you do by any stretch of the imagination because I'm, I'm stuck in the historical period up until around 1980. Uh, but um, still, just to, to, to see the, what comes into play in these images of what actually is what are the Carpathians or what is what are the Bishjada? How do you define them when you have your same problem with defining Biao Vieja? All, all of this has, has parallels. Yeah. And the ethnic cleansing of the past. Oh, yeah. yeah. I can't wait to read your book, Patrice. Mm -hmm. Maybe still an, another question which which is probably too big for other for our discussion, but I, I, I wonder how this, this close society of Białowieża or of Stoczek really works. How the, the, the people there, many of the people have their so-called Białorusian background, or you might call it differently. How do they live together with the Poles which who don't have this background? Of course, they live together in, in different situations and uh, it, it, it's obvious, but do they, do they um, implicitly rely on their own traditions when they behave in a way, for instance, um, supporting national Polish politics concerning refugees, concerning nature conservation, and so on. If the, is there such a difference, or is it is it too too big a, a, um, a difference which uh, you, which is not defined by their national belongings, but rather their situation in different groups or in, in situations they worked in everyday life. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, uh, I always think this question is important. And I have a lot of data, right? <laughs> I've had a lot of experiences, but I always hate answering it because it makes me say like, oh, I know that that person is Pravoslavne, you know, that person is Orthodox or Belarusian and that person is not, or that person, oh, why they had a Belarusian mother, but they went to the Catholic church after, you know, they got married and they only identify as being Polish and they never think of that. So it's interesting, it's very interesting for me to see the dynamics um, across a, a number of villages um, and to see them over the years that I've been going there. So um, for those of you who've never been there or don't know this place, um, I mean, there's this forest and kind of in the center of the forest, there's this village called Bielvieja, which has 1200 residents. And that includes a few small villages nearby. And then there's the town of Hainufka, which is about 20 kilometers away. And it was, you know, started as an industrial logging town and probably has 30,000 inhabitants, maybe less more. Um, and there are many, many more people in Hainufka who just very clearly identify as being Orthodox, as being Belarusian. There's a Belarusian cultural museum there. Um, even when people are speaking Polish in Hainufka, like I hear more of a distinct regional accent. So in so many ways, since I've been going to Białowieża, the village, the center of scientific institutes and uh, the national park, like, I've really seen an undergrounding of identity, of a Belarusian identity. Um, you don't hear the language in the shops as much. Um, 
I mean, there are so many new arrivants who have come there. I mean, so many tourists. So I could still tell you which families uh, belong to the Orthodox Church. And, you know, there's, it's not like I personally know 1,200 people. <laughs> like, I might know, you know, 100, 200 people. And, you know, of those, when I return, maybe I visit 15 families or people that I really enjoy and know. So I, I don't want to appear as like, I'm an expert on who identifies in which way. Um, but what I saw, I mean, with the kind of rise of peace was that there was a strong um, voting opposition to peace amongst those who saw themselves as Belarusian. But there are many people who voted for peace that I know whose maybe grandmother was Belarusian and then she married somebody Polish and they might still have in their family this like, oh yes, at one point we actually lived in what is now Belarus, but now we're here and now we support peace and let's not talk about it. Um, so I, I mean, how to interpret that? I, I do interpret it as a kind of Polonization of the region through media, right? Through tourism, through education and schools. I mean, there's a Belarusian language high school in Hainufka today, but where I don't think all classes are taught in Belarusian, but that's it's sort of known that like, this is the Belarusian high school and maybe there's still a class in, in Belarusian. And then there's the Polish high school and same with um, in Bielsk, uh, Biao. Sorry, I might be getting the name wrong. I'm, I'm far away, but which is, you know, another maybe 40 kilometers from uh, Hainufka. So there are places, I think like the closer you get to the centrality of Beovieja becoming a Polish forest, you know, this, the way that peace has worked on this forest, the more you see this receding of Belarusianness, I think into the private domain. Whereas just outside of the forest, you still see a lot of identity around being Belarusian and opposing peace, but also, um, you know, not being strongly politically active, I would say. Um, this is something that comes out in my book as well in, in a kind of oppositionist sense. And I know, I also wanna emphasize like there are so many stories within this region and I can only tell one part of them. So take what I tell you as as being very partial, informed, in conversation with people over many years, but still partial. Yeah, Anastasia. Thank you very much. I would like to actually ask you, Eunice, to follow up on what have you just said and follow up on what Patrice and Marcos were asking about Belarus in terms of, well, as we know, the forest itself uh, is split between Poland and Belarus, right? But the book, however, follows the Polish part of the story of the forest. Um, and my question is whether your decision not uh, to tell the story of the forest from both perspective, perspectives actually follows up um, on the very methodology, which is anthropological. And this means that you would have need to spend another 20 something years writing between Poland and, and Belarus, or like, what does this decision uh, depended on and like why you went for, for the Polish poverty, not Belarusians, although, as you have just said, these two um, sides of the stories, um, identity, let's put it this way, are closely interrelated. Yeah, yeah, this is purely practical. Um, yeah, I just, it, um, Within the book, I unfold how I came to the Polish side of the forest, how I came to know people. It's a language issue. I mean, certainly I could learn Russian and, uh, and I have ambitions to do research in Belarus, but this is not exactly the moment when Belarus is open to an American researcher who's written a book like this. Um, yeah, yeah, so it's purely practical, uh, but I would love to tell more of the Belarusian side, which Marcus's book does. But of course, I'm I'm uh, not an expert for the Belarusian side uh, yes. either. So I learned many things about that. So for instance, that the population living there on the Belarusian side 
uh, was uh, sub submitted to a, to a migration process after the Second World War. So the people living there now are not the same, are not the, 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 the heirs of the people uh, who lived there uh, before World War II and in Polish, uh, as uh, everything was Polish. So of course, there is a different way of feeling um, um, close to this, to this forest and different historical traditions. So uh, of course it was uh, such a planned uh, migration process, at, at least partially, by in, in the Stalinist uh, Stalin uh, era, but uh, uh, the strict separation between the two parts um, uh, over over many years uh, has has contributed to this development. And of course there have been possibilities to to speak to each other. If there, of course there have been relatives on on each side of the border who talked and, and sometimes met, but it was much more difficult. And as we see now, it might be the same now, nowadays with the border closed and, and separated from each other, they, they won't be the possibility to talk to, to each other. And so they are oriented on, on both sides from the periphery to the, uh, to the centers, which are Minsk and Warsaw, let's say. Yeah, I mean, from an ethnographic perspective, I know people who had relatives in Belarus, but not exactly in the forest, but very close to the forest, but they would have to travel all the way to Grodno. You couldn't just travel. There was a border crossing that opened. This is chapter five of the book, uh, but it was only to tourists. If you were from Bielvieja or any of the nearby villages and you had family on the other side, yeah, you either had to cross at Grodno or in Brest you know, which is a good whole day's travel to get to see your relatives. Um, so people just weren't um, weren't going very often or seeing, you know, there, there was no real return to like, this is the place that I was born, that I came from, I'm going back to Belarus. I mean, a lot of people would say, oh, I saw my family five years ago or 10 years ago, we visited once. Um, I didn't meet that many people. But you know, interestingly, before Schengen, there were so many Belarusian petty traders who came into Hainufka and then even went into the villages of Bielvieja selling cigarettes, underwear, uh, knickknacks, I mean, anything, just knocking door to door. And that was a very interesting moment of, of possibility for I think what, what it meant to um, exist on both sides of the border. And I wish that I had done more research with with those people. Um, but you know, it's also interesting. I've, I've been on the Belarusian side of the forest twice, the, who the tourists are. I mean, like people ride on motorcycle all the way from Moscow for days to get to this forest, you know, and they recall different songs. I mean, there's this very beautiful song about the forest and the bison in Russian, you know, that people have in their hearts. And I haven't heard anyone in Poland who actually knows that song. And again, here's the story of Soviet Union dissolves on the Belarusian side of the border, but nobody remembers this or talks about it on the Polish side of the border. These really seem like separate zones. I mean, in this period that I'm writing about, the, the post-socialist period in which you think, oh, walls are coming down, but the, the Schengen, I think even, means even less contact how is that so? Or the Belarusians that I know are going to Vilnius to go to school and then maybe they go to Białystok to do their shopping. Um, but you know, they, it's not about being in this forest and crossing that border, except as, um, except as tourists, which is mostly Polish tourists going into Belarus. Well, I'm still trying to see if we have any possible questions coming out here. I, I'm enjoying this discussion very much and learning even more about the book and about the place and people. Uh, no, no more voices here. No more cat meows, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Cute cat there. Oh, that's right, someone does have a cat up. Um, I, I'm assuming this is more or less the last chance unless we have some more themes that we want to, to uh, follow up on. No? Well, I can I ask, 
the historians here. Um, I, I think Marcus said this isn't really a book about memory, and I would agree. But could we have a discussion about memory? And um, you know, is is memory something that's written historically? Is it something that uh, haunts one? Um, why, in your interpretation of the book, Marcus, do you think that this is not really a book about memory? How, how does that category memory work? I think that, that memory is especially connected to the past. And, and your book is, is, is of course, some, has some aspects of history and historical uh, events and so on. But it's rather a book about, about people, about the situations, uh, places, and time, and, and stories. But not not also not not only about the how the how the people remember the past, how they shape the past. Of course, it's, this is a part of it, but it's not 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 the central point. I think it's rather the central point is the place and, and time, and um, not the way how they interpret um, uh, the past and and create new models in order to um, to 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 have personal, political, economic, and so on advantages from it. I know that is no that is this is no not a not a definition of memory because of course you could understand memory in a broader way. And if, if you take everything which is uh, connected with this so-called um, second uh, uh, dimension of, of history is, is called memory, then I, I could uh, I could agree that it's somehow also a book about memory, but my interpretation of memory is a bit narrow, more narrow, narrower. So um, it's rather it's rather uh, such such a feeling, as I know that that many studies about uh, the the factor of of memory in history and uh, um, places of remembrance and 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 so on, lieu de memoir. Um, and and that that's something quite different. But maybe Patrice has a, a different opinion in, the, in 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 this point, or some somebody else. And I can jump in. Um, there is this um, new new category uh, appearing now: envir environmental memory, which is promoted uh, in Poland by this historian Małgorzata Fraczek. And uh, so so maybe if we when we sh if we shift in understanding memory from this political, historical, uh, thinking about events, about our identity into the, uh, into the sphere of nature and how uh, remembering nature and uh, building our relationship with some na natural places, uh, how it, uh, so, so, so uh, maybe that this was there actually in, in the book. And the, here is the question to Eunice, if you, uh, if you encounter that that category environmental memory and would you uh, would you ag agree if you 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 some you, your book somehow can fit into it oh yeah um i haven't read the author that you mentioned but i would love to um and you know i i nod to simon shama's landscape and memory uh but you know there he's thinking about how memory resides in landscape and not the other way around. I mean, there are ways in which I know environmental historians are trying to think about, uh, you know, in the environment. And I'm like, you know, maybe I, I feel like memory is this category for me that uh, is hot and I don't want to touch it because I, <laughs> it might commit me to other frames of thinking. But the way I most think about memory, I guess, is this imprint, which is a word that Marcus had us focusing on earlier. Um, and for me, I mean, that bark beetle in chapter six is doing this imprint by being very active. You know, it's, it's leaving an imprint in trees, but that imprint is not something that's like a boss relief. That imprint is like, oh, now the tree is falling to the ground. Now the tree is uh, the tree is moistening the soil, which is so important in this drying out period that we're living in. Um, and then what's what's happening in that area of soil that might be more moist? You know, I mean, 
I want to think about memory in terms of that forest, not only in terms of like, oh, did this cursed soldier um, <laughs> kill some Belarusians? But I, I see this not as separate, right? The way the bark beetle is behaving, acting, having this outbreak, and the way humans are coming together um, to also maybe do some forgetting about the past. I mean, I would certainly say the environmental activists in this story in chapter six are, are trying to take us out of memory and into the possibility of a post-nationalist future. And, uh, you know, these are people that don't want to talk about uh, World War II and communism, like they want to think about how to be socially organized. So it's sort of like, what are the, what are the echoes that are all around in memory um, that, that I can weave through without impressing that, oh, this is the only one you need to remember. So I'm still committed to this like multiverse or plurality of voices while trying to tell you which voices, which memories, which stories seemed the loudest to me, but then not just to reproduce them, but to like pull these stories into another um, into another realm. And that realm is not just a hall of mirrors, like, oh, here are all, all of these stories refracting off of each other. But I see my work as, as political in the sense that like, where do we wanna go from here? Like here's where, here's how you showed yourself to me. And that's because of these limitations, but like really what are the possibilities for imagining this forest into the future based on what the creatures in this forest are doing based upon what the humans are saying about the past, but how do we, how do we create a little opening to say, oh, can, can we look out and maybe see something new that we hadn't saw before? That's going to, I mean, this is a you know, very Donna Haraway uh, example of the cat's cradle game. <laughs> Sorry, I, I know for the people who haven't read it, it makes no sense. But Donna Haraway is always trying to get us to think about how things are configured together. Um, and this is you know, actor network theory too, um, that it depends on who is assembling and how and what kind of political agency they can bring together. But these assemblages, can, can fall apart and form new assemblages um, based upon the ruins of the other one. I mean, this is that kind of ecological thinking. And so can, if you could put in the chat window the name of the, um, the main thinker of this Polish movement of yes. environment and memory. Yes, uh, she, she's just now working on a translation of her book. Uh, she was our guest uh, here in September and uh, the recording of her of the seminar is on oh. our website. Excellent. So, so yeah, I will. Uh, thank you very much, Anja, for, for this for this hint on on uh, um, environmental uh, uh, memory because I think is th this is a, a possibility to 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 develop further our our understanding of of space and of time, and uh, and uh, as I as I know I I, I, I know the, the the research of of, of Morgosha and mm -hmm. and she is she was to my mind the, the very first in Poland uh, who who tried to to develop such such a model. From from a historical, but not all, uh, not only perspective, and um, and um, I've, I for myself tried to 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 write such a such a assemblage text about Białowieża, which hopefully will be published next year after a peer review. I don't know, to 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 describe how we could we could we could experience Białowieża with all our senses, but but knowing that it's only an, a temporal and personal and <clears throat> very subjective way of understanding this region but this is this would be also a trial the same as Yunis did um, to open much more points much more aspects and not to be in a certain way totalitarian to define what Biao Vieja is and always has been so so let's see
unmute myself. Here we go. Uh, any last words, Eunice? Because I think we're coming close to the end of the period. I think it's it's been a very interesting conversation. I've certainly been learning a lot from it, getting everyone's different points of views on the, your subject more broadly, as well as uh, focused on the book itself. Yeah. I just want to put out a big thank you to everyone, to the organizers, to Patrice and Marcus. Um, it's just an honor to, you know, so much of writing a book is sitting alone in a room, and I just know many of you know that, or an article or anything, and then just to realize, oh, uh, something that I created with all of the other beings in that forest um, is growing, is spreading, is changing. Um, that's very rewarding. Um, so thank you. Yes. Well, thank thank you for writing the book that we so we could read it and enjoy it and profit from it. All right. So we will be then concluding. From the organizers, thank you very much, Patrice. Thank you very much, Marcus, and thank you very much, Unis, for. Uh, the idea to, to have this discussion in the first place and dear audience, uh, we would be very, we would like to welcome you in five weeks for our December seminar that will take place on December 6th and you could see uh, details of the event on our website uh, already. We will be discussing the book by Stefan Jage, The Second World War in the 21st Century Museum, the, actually because there are several museums to discuss. And this is a topic that is very close to a lot of people uh, that are in and around the Posa um circle of interest. And uh, see you all, hopefully, in five weeks. And thank you very much once again. And I'll stick around if anyone wants to talk afterwards, if that's OK. Yeah. Sure.